The lecture today, it is, it is about modeling gene expression regulation. So if you remember, uh, what we were discussing is uh, the most simple input that you can make. And this most simple input was actually the Hill function. So this was the case uh, that N ligands are binding to receptor. And now uh, the question is, what happens if we have more, more elaborate regulation? So uh, from those of you who, who come from biology background or even from, for people from physics, you may have heard that typically uh, gene regulation uh, can be very elaborate. Uh, you can have one transcription factor, you can have more transcription factor, factors. Some of them can repress transcription, some of them can activate transcription, and so on. Uh, in other words, we can have uh, relatively complex interactions both between proteins and DNA and both, with, both proteins with themselves. So uh, what I primarily want to show you today is how you treat such examples. In other words, uh, if you have such interactions, how to predict uh, activity, that is transcription rate of your gene, how many transcripts per second your gene will make. Okay. Uh, so in other words, uh, to go back to this example that I gave you, uh, so uh, here we had the gene, and this is Lac Hopper, and I, I'll not repeat the biology behind it. Uh, I, I explained this in the first lecture. But uh, the main point is that we have some proteins uh, which are being bound to DNA. And then we have also RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase is this enzyme which transcribes genes. And when RNA polymerase is transcribing the gene, the gene is, uh, the gene is being expressed. Uh, also, in addition to having interactions uh, between proteins and DNA, we can also have interactions between proteins themselves. For example, here, activator, uh, here it is shown in green, uh, is interacting with RNA polymerase. It is actually recruiting RNA polymerase to DNA. And now uh, our question is the following. So uh, if we have all these possibilities, all these conform conformations, and given some interaction energies, what should be the rate of expression of our gene? That is, uh, how many messenger RNAs per second uh, will be expressed from this gene? And this is also called transcription activity. So th these are all different terms for the same thing. OK. Uh, now, I, I will directly go to, to the way how you, how you do it. Uh, OK. Uh, so uh, the first thing that you do is that you sketch, you sketch I'm sorry, sketch uh, all possible configurations of proteins and RNA polymerase on DNA on your promoter. So this would correspond to sketch like this. So for example, here you have repressor, activator, RNA polymerase. So what can happen on the promoter is the, that repressor can be bound, uh, repressor and activator can be bound together, RNA polymerase and activator can be bound as well. Uh, for example, here RNA polymerase cannot be bound. Do you see why? So what is repressor doing? Right, it is on the same side, so it is excluding RNA polymerase to be bound. That is why it is repressor. Also here, RNA polymerase cannot bind. And also importantly, you can have empty DNA, right? Okay, uh, this is the first step. And then for every of these configurations, what you do is to write appropriate statistical weight. So statistical weight is proportional to the probability that this particular configuration will be realized. So we, this means that here we will have one statistical weight, second, third, fourth statistical weight. And actually, by convention, we take the statistical weight of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of DNA uh, of empty promoter, that is DNA without proteins being bound, is equal to one. So, so in a way, you normalize all the statistical weights uh, with, respect to, uh, with respect to empty promoter. Okay. Uh, then uh, the basic assumption is that transcription activity is proportional to equilibrium binding probability of RNA polymerase to the promoter. So what happens is that the gene will be transcribed only when RNA polymerase will be bound to the promoter. And this is why the transcription activity is taken to be proportional to the equilibrium binding probability of, RNAs, uh, of RNA polymerase to the promoter. That is. Uh, in other words, to put it more quantitatively, what you do is that you sum all statistical weights which correspond to, to activation configurations. 
activation configurations means those configurations when, in which the gene is transcribed, or in more practical terms, these configurations where RNA polymerase is being bound to the promoter, because only these configurations you can have transcriptions, transcription divided by the sum of all statistical weights. So in other words, you divide it by the partition function. Okay. And now, uh, there is one thing you might have noticed. Uh, what I have written here is equilibrium binding probability of RNA polymerase to the promoter. Now, uh, in at least two lectures uh, in this school, what was emphasized is that typically systems without, within the cell are actually far out of equilibrium. Uh, so Ralph and Elizabeth were both talking about that. So uh, now, uh, one question. Why we can do that? Why we can take equilibrium binding probability of RNA polymerase to the promoter? And even more, just to remind you how RNA polymerase uh, works. So what happens is that RNA polymerase binds and unbinds to the promoter. Okay. Uh, then it opens the DNA. So this is this step. But then once it, it opens the DNA, it will leave the promoter. And actually, this part will essentially be irreversible re re relation. I'm sorry, irreversible re uh, reaction. So once RNA polymerase leaves the promoter, it does not go back. And now if you have irreversible reaction, uh, can you have equilibrium in your process, in your entire process? Yes, no? No. Right, yeah. Equilibrium you, right, equilibrium you cannot have, right? So if you have, if you have a one directional biochemical reaction, uh, so if RNA polymerase just uh, goes in the forward direction, if it, if it cannot go back, then you cannot have equilibrium. Still, what we write is equilibrium binding probability of RNA polymerase to the promoter. Uh, can you, can you imagine why? So it, it goes back to this quasi-equilibrium approximation that I was telling you about. So when can we treat uh, some part of bio biochemical reaction to be approximately in equilibrium? When it happens, what, fast, slow, with respect to other steps in the reaction? Okay, so when it happens fast, right? So when you have part of the biochemical reaction with, which happens fast with respect to other steps, you can approximately take it to be an equilibrium. And the second thing that, which I was mentioning is that it is really important to know the numbers. And actually numbers here, so this binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter and unbinding, it happens on the order of seconds. While this step is actually uh, surprisingly slow, opening the two strands of DNA, it takes at least one order of magnitude more. It, it happens on the order of tens of seconds or, or even hundred seconds. So this is the reason why we can take binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter to be in equilibrium because it is fast process with respect to other parts of the transcription reaction which happens. Okay. Now, uh, okay, and uh, now, uh, so I told you essentially everything expect how to write these statistical weights. Now, uh, we have basically two, two basic cases. One is activation of transcription, and the other is repression of transcription. So I first explain it for activation, and then on repression, and then we will go to the more complex case when you have both activation and repression. Actually, I will, I will let you finish that. Okay. Uh, but what is the basic thing? So uh, as I mentioned, uh, essentially as convention, when you have an empty promoter, you take your statistical weight uh, to be equal to one. Now, uh, here, so uh, we are looking just this part, okay? All the other is, is just to remind you that all these proteins can bind to other places, but now we are looking to just our gene and its promoter, so we are looking at this region, okay? So uh, what happens here is that uh, we have empty promoter, so statistical weight is one. Here we have only RNA polymerase which is being bound. Okay, so concentration of RNA polymerase is labeled by P here. Okay, and then the statistical weight will be P, concentration of RNA polymerase, multiplied by the Boltzmann term, essentially. So this beta is uh, KBT. And this delta epsilon PD is interaction energy between RNA polymerase and DNA. Okay, 
And this is the most important thing to get. So uh, the statistical weight consists of two parts. One is called the entropy contribution. So this is concentration of, uh, concentration of the molecule which is being bound to the DNA. And the other is exponent of whatever interaction energy you have in this configuration. Okay. Uh, so this term is sort of logical, right? Because if you have larger interaction energy, then uh, the protein will, be, will, uh, will more easily bind to the DNA. And then this term, it's called the entropy contribution because it, it tells you uh, if you have larger con concentration of our protein in the solution, the more it will want to go to the DNA, the, one in, the more it will want to, to escape from the solution. And the reason is uh, because uh, everything likes uh, to have more states available. That is, everything likes to increase its entropy. In other words, so if your protein has more, more space in the solution to wiggle around, uh, then it will be more happy. And if it is crowded in the solution, then it will want to escape to the DNA. And this is why we have this term which is proportional to the protein concentration. Okay. Now, this is for RNA polymerase. Now, we can have also activator being bound without RNA polymerase. Then it's the same thing. So it is, again, concentration of the protein which is bound to the DNA. This is A, activator concentration. Again, the Boltzmann term, but now uh, it is the interaction energy of activator with DNA. And now, finally, uh, the most, so to say, complex case. So here we have both activator and RNA polymerase which are being bound to the DNA. So then we have product of concentrations of the proteins which are bound to the DNA. So uh, RNA polymerase here, activator here. And in the exponent here, there come all the interaction energy. So the interaction energy of RNA polymerase with DNA, the, the interaction energy of activator with DNA, but also importantly, we have protein-protein interaction energy. So this is interaction energy between the activator and RNA polymerase. So we have three terms here because uh, we are modeling this with, with three interaction energies. Okay. Uh, so uh, up to now, was this clear, how we formed these statistical weights? Okay. And now our transcription activity, as we, say, as we said, it is proportional to the equilibrium binding probability of RNA polymerase to the promoter, which means here we write sum of all statistical weights which correspond to activating configurations. And what are the activating co configurations here? So here is first, second, third, fourth. Can you tell me? So this one, is it activating configuration? Do we have transcription here? No. This one, yes or no? Well, you just look if you have your RNA polymerase bound there. It's very simple, right? So yes, it is, right? Here we do not have RNA polymerase, and here we get, again have RNA polymerase. So in the numerator, we have statistical weights of this configuration, so here it is. And we have statistical weight of this configuration, here it is, because here we have RNA polymerase bound to the promoter, okay? And uh, down there, we have sum of all the statistical weights, so this is our partition function, okay? Okay, and now this term is proportional to, to the transcription activity of this gene. That is proportional to how many transcripts per unit time will be, will be made uh, from this gene. Okay, uh, now we have the case of repression. So it's very simple. Again, empty promoter, statistical weight one. Uh, RNA polymerase bound to the promoter. So here we have just concentration of RNA polymerase. This is P. We have interaction energy of RNA polymerase with DNA. It is this term here. And then we have just repressor, which is bound to the DNA. So uh, again, concentration of repressor times exponent of this interaction energy between the repressor and DNA. Now here note, again, when repressor is bound to DNA, RNA polymerase cannot bind. So it is different from here. The point of the activator is to recruit RNA polymerase. So when activator is bound, RNA polymerase will very much like to be bound. But then this is just excluding RNA polymerase to be bound to the promoter. Okay. And now, uh, so can you tell me uh, what is the activating configuration here? Which one? First, second, or third? 
the second, exactly right. So you're looking for the configuration just where RNA polymerase is there, right? Here there is no RNA polymerase, here there is no RNA polymerase. So again, we have this statistical weight divided by all the statistical weights, right? Divided again by the partition function. Okay, now this is our actual lock operon, and uh, I will leave you to, to write uh, the transcription activity for this case. Uh, but just tell me, uh, so again, what are the activating configurations here? What, what should go to the numerator? Exactly, the second one and the fourth one. So these two terms should go to the numerator, and then everything else uh, just goes to the denominator of the transcription activity. Okay, and, and so no matter how complex your configuration is, and by the way, so here is the example of DNA, but it doesn't matter, you know. It can be proteins where different ligands are being bound. It doesn't matter as long as uh, you put together all the interaction energies and you know what is being bound, uh, you can write appropriate uh, expression. Okay, and again, uh, just note here, here are the interaction energies not only of two proteins with DNA, but also the protein-protein interaction energies. Why, for example, here we have two proteins being bound. This is why we have two interaction energies, because these two proteins do not interact with each other. So it is just binding energy of one protein with DNA and binding energy of the other protein with DNA. Okay. Okay, uh, now example. So uh, it's, it's again simplified uh, example from, from our research. It, con in, it corresponds to restriction modification systems. That is how they are established in bacteria. And I should say it's, it's collaboration with experimentalists. So uh, it also, in some sense, illustrates this uh, cycle of, sort of new cycle of knowledge that I was discussing where experiment theory and experiment are uh, separated, but they work together in order to understand the system. Okay. Uh, so I should tell you something about restriction modification systems. So I was telling previously about, uh, I was telling you about CRISPR-Cas systems. So these are these advanced bacterial immune systems. On the other hand, restriction modification systems are also bacterial immune systems, but they are more rudimental. Although actually they have very large application in biotechnology because for decades now they are used to cut DNA uh, where you need it. Okay, now, uh, why is it immune system in the bacteria? So restriction modification system, it consists of, of two parts. One is restriction enzyme. So this is this yellow thing which likes to cut things. Okay. And the other is, uh, and the other is metal transferase. So metal transferase is shown by uh, green here. So uh, the restriction enzyme will cut any sequence which has appropriate recognition site unless this sequence is methylated. And this is then important because, as you can see, uh, what will happen is uh, that when virus comes, vi virus DNA comes into the cell, it will not be methylated, therefore it will not be protected, and therefore it will be cut uh, by the restriction enzyme. On the other hand, for the host genome, the host genome will be protected by the methylase, and therefore it will not be cut. So this is then a very simple system in order to uh, not to have autoimmunity. So uh, the restriction enzyme will not cut its own genome because it, if it would cut its own genome, it will be dead itself, right? But on the other hand, it will cut uh, virus which, uh, which, wants to, uh, which wants to attack the cell. Okay, uh, so this looks fairly simple, but then... What is interesting in that is that these restriction mo mo modification systems, they're, they're very mo mobile. And typically, uh, they are encoded by plasmids, so they can spread from one bacterial cell to the other by horizontal gene transfer. So uh, in other words, what, what happened, we have our restriction modification system, and then this restriction modification system uh, should enter the cell. And now there is a problem, right? because restriction modification system has both restriction enzyme and metal transferase. So the problem now is that the host genome is not protected by the methylase because the system is still not in the cell. And then this means that restriction enzyme, which is expressed together with the metal transferase, it can cut the host genome. 
And this is the problem because then both restriction enzyme and the host cell would be dead. So uh, it is clear that this, uh, this entry of restriction modification system into the cell, it has to be very tightly regulated so that the whole genome is protected first by methylase and only afterwards it is being cut by the restriction enzyme. Uh, so the question is now how this, uh, how this uh, control happens. And by the way, restriction modification system, uh, systems in biochemistry and molecular biology, they're standard model system for very tight control of expression of genes. Uh, because evidently this is a matter of life and death again for the system. Okay, so uh, here is provided a scheme of a typical restriction modification system. So here is restriction enzyme. This is this thing which cuts DNA. Here is methyl transferase. It actually consists of two parts. Uh, one methylase thing and the other is being bound to the same sequences which are recognized by the restriction enzyme. But now also importantly, in, in addition to restriction enzyme and metal transferase, there is the third component, which is control protein. So control protein is actually transcription factor, which regulates uh, the transcription of this system. That is in particular, it binds upstream of both its solvent gene and the restriction enzyme. And in this way, it regulates, regulates their transcription. So this C is basically like these transcription factors that I was telling you about, okay? And now, uh, so what is interesting here? Uh, well, again, we, ca we, ca we come to large cooperativity. I was emphasizing this uh, since the first lecture. It turns out that binding of this uh, control protein, of this transcription factor to DNA, it is extremely cooperative. In the sense that if you have only DNA, if you do not have RNA polymerase, uh, as soon as uh, one dimer of, uh, of this transcription factor of the control protein is bound to DNA, it will immediately recruit the other dimer. In other words, in the absence of RNA polymerase, you will not see at all dimer bind, bound, being bound to the DNA, but you will see either empty DNA or you will see tetramer. And by the way, uh, even to bind, two monomers must, must uh, come to a dimer. So this is actually the first step of co cooperativity. And then secondly, as, it, as I said, as soon as one dimer is bound to DNA, the other will be immediately recruited. Okay. Uh, so then, by the way, one question is how the transcription happens, right? Because uh, if you have only empty DNA, only this configuration will happen. Only tetramer will be bounded. RNA polymerase should bind here. Now, uh, what really happens is that when you add RNA polymerase, it happens that RNA polymerase will displace uh, one of these two dimers. So it will displace this dimer, and in this way we will have the activating configuration. So in other words, here we have a uh, free configuration, actually four if you take this trivial one where the promoter is empty. But you have either just RNA polymerase being bound to the promoter, you have this activating configuration, where uh, this C protein acts as an activator. So there is interaction energy between RNA polymerase and this C dimer. And there is the repressor configuration where you have, uh, where you have it bound as a tetramer. Okay, and now, uh, so actually I will leave you as an exercise to, to write transcription activity. So this is, uh, this is the problem that you should do. You have indicated all the binding energy Energies and uh, by the way, so what are here two activating configurations? This one is it activating? No, right, no. So when, when we have RNA polymerase, these are activating. So this one and this one are activating configurations. So then we know how to write the transcription activity. Okay, so again, it will be the problem. It's written on the on the slides. Okay. Uh, but now, now that we have this transcription activity, we can uh, test this model. Does it really work? And actually, in systems biology, it is very much, uh, so this is actually a simple illustration of, again, more general principle. So in uh, systems biology, uh, very much the same approach as in experimental molecular biology applies. So if you have a model, typically your model should not only explain the system as it is. It should not only explain the wild type system but it should also explain all 
possible perturbations of the system that can be done. And this is what in molecular biology are called mutants. So in other words, here is the VAR type system, and here are three mutants that you can make. And the mutants here mean that you mutate these binding sites, you change these binding sites for uh, the proteins, and then by doing that, you evidently will perturb your binding energies. So indeed, uh, what you see is that the model can reasonably explain both the wild type data and the mutants. And also, uh, the constants which you get from the fit agree with the type of the mutations that you, that you have, actually. Uh, when you have mutation, then appropriate binding energy will go down, and this agrees with the type of the fit. So uh, this, this then tells us that this people call it statistical thermodynamical approach, indeed can reasonably realistic explain uh, control of gene expression. This is one example, and there, there are more, of course. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so this is actually our input. So what we have modeled here is, uh, up to now, uh, how transcription activity depends on the concentration of, of C protein. Uh, and now we want to write the dynamics. Okay. So now, uh, this will again be later in the problem that I will give you, so pay attention how we, how, how we write uh, the, the, the dynamics when it, when it comes to uh, the gene expression. So we have two steps. The first step is transcription. So here the transcripts are generated. So they're generated by transcription activity, that is RNA polymerase makes some, num some number of transcripts per unit time. So this is the first term. And then the second term is this decay term. So uh, we explained it on the, on the, on the uh, second class. So uh, you must have decay, and this is decay of transcripts. Okay. Uh, now here we have the second step, and this step, step is translation. So once you have a transcript, the protein will be translated from the transcript. So think about the central dogma. And now uh, here we have two things. So uh, one thing is uh, translation. So uh, from messenger RNA, we have proteins being translated. And then again, we have the decay term, the proteins being degraded. OK. And now uh, what really happens, what is sort of really nice, and, and you see how the biological systems are really can be fine-tuned. Uh, you have two proteins here, and one is control protein, and the other is restriction enzyme. And actually, uh, what happens out is that this transla translation rate uh, of the control protein, which is actually uh, significantly smaller than translation rate of the, of the restriction enzyme. Uh, so the control protein has very small, uh, has uh, actually a small translation rate. Uh, and can you see by any chance why, why this can be useful? Uh, so remember, uh, you really want to make the delay. So you want the methyl transferase to be expressed first, and you want your restriction enzyme to be expressed only later. So uh, to have this, this activation configuration, what, what must happen? What, what must be bound to DNA? What must be present? Well, RNA polymerase must be present, uh, of course, but then the other thing is what? The C protein, right? So if you delay the synthesis of the C protein, automatically you will also delay uh, the synthesis uh, of the restriction enzyme. Okay. So this is, this is one mechanism in which this delay happens. And then uh, if you actually simulate uh, these equations, and again, you plot your amount of restriction enzyme versus time, and also your metal transfer rates versus time, you indeed see uh, this delay uh, pronounced uh, quite nicely. So in other words, uh, the metal transfer is, is, uh, is expressed first so that the genome is protected. And then only once the genome is protected, what will happen is that the restriction enzyme is turned on. And it's actually being turned on uh, uh, rapidly. And this rapid turn on of the restriction enzyme is exactly due to what? Well, again and again, when we want to have a switch-like behavior, uh, the most standard way to do this is through uh, cooperativity in protein binding. And this is the reason the, why we have this extreme uh, cooperativity in binding of the C protein. So it makes this switch-like behavior. So uh, once the system is protected, 
this diction enzyme should go to on state as soon as possible, and it should go to on state as soon as possible because so that the entire bacteria is protected. Because remember, viruses are attacking bacteria all the time. So as soon as a bacteria is protected, the better it is uh, to the bacteria. Uh, OK. Uh, fine. Uh, so a uh, small conclusion about this restriction modification system. So this toxic molecule, as I mentioned, is expressed in a narrow time interval and with a delay in, in, with respect to the antidote. And actually, here this happens to two mechanisms, uh, two large uh, by cooperativity and binding, and two modulation of translation efficiency. And uh, actually, uh, if you remember, if you remember uh, the second class, uh, what we talked about is the third mechanism, which is which is uh, actually quite ex eccentric on, on how you can you can get this. Uh, this rapid transition from off to on state in the case of CRISPR-Cas. Right, so this was this control at the level of, of transcript processing. Okay. So uh, large binding, large cooperativity in protein binding is important, but it's not the only way in which you can, you can uh, achieve uh, switch-like behavior of the system. Okay. Uh, and so here is your problem. And, well, this is what you should do. Of course, if you have any questions or problems uh, come to ask me. So uh, as the essence is that you start by writing all the transcription configurations, then you write description activity of the system, uh, then you write the dynamics of the system, uh, and then uh, what you should do is, is actually derive, actually, and gra graphically sketch. And you can also solve it numerically if you have uh, something that, that can do numerics right now with you. Uh, but you can sketch the equili equilibrium state of this system. Okay. Uh, okay. And now, uh, so, so if you remember, on the second uh, class, uh, I was going to oscillators, and then it was almost uh, actually it was completely qualitative discussion. So there was no math in, in that, and the reason is because uh, we still did not have this apparatus uh, available uh, for uh, modeling uh, for modeling uh, control of gene expression. Now, uh, I will actually get back to the oscillators, uh, as uh, they are also very nice examples of how we, we apply this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, for, uh, this methodology for uh, modeling uh, gene expression re regulation. OK. Uh, and also, by giving you sort of more math details, uh, we will also go to some of the beginnings of uh, mathematical bi biology. Uh, and by the way, we were, we were also doing this uh, in the working group uh, in more detail. So there we went to uh, there we went uh, to uh, more math, basically uh, to types of bifurcations that can happen and so on. Uh, so this will be just a simplified discussion of that. Okay. So uh, going back to history, so uh, this is so-called uh, Goodwin oscillator, and this goes. Uh, back to the time of uh, Brian Goodwin. He was actually one of the founders of mathematical biology. It was uh, 1965. Uh, so uh, he proposed the first model uh, of the molecular oscillator, of the oscillator within the cell. Now, uh, I purposefully emphasize the year because, uh, well, uh, this was much before the time that uh, people started to understand how circadian oscillators are working. Uh, if you remember, uh, the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering molecular, molecular mechanisms behind circadian oscillators, uh, it was awarded in 2017. So at this time, people knew actually nothing about uh, how oscillations within the cell happen. So uh, this was, at that point, a poorly theoretical model. So what uh, Goodwin was proposing is that uh, let me say we have our gene, and then gene expresses uh, messenger RNA. It then gets translated to protein. But then in addition, there is another step. So uh, he introduced some metabolite here, and then this metabolite represses expression of gene. Okay. And he also said at that time it may not be metabolite. It may be more some, for example, active form of this Y. But in any way, whatever this Z will be, we will have a negative feedback loop, and then this gene will be expressed. I'm sorry, repressed. Okay. And now we, have a, we can understand equations as well. Okay. 
so this, this is synthesis of transcripts. Uh, here we have repression, so it is just repression. So then this is uh, the weight uh, to have n repressor molecules, n of the z molecules be, being bound. Okay. Uh, of course, we have decay as well. And then uh, this, this corresponds to translation. Okay. Uh, and then what Goodwin did is that he simulated the system. And uh, as a matter of fact, if you go back to, to this original paper, uh, it is very interesting because you can also see how, how the numerics was done at that time. Uh, what he was discussing is, uh, well, uh, nowadays doing simulation, uh, I mean, solving these dis differential equations is uh, very easy. But at, at that point, actually, uh, what he needed to employ is, uh, he, he employed essentially uh, a computer at MIT, which was analog to the supercomputers that we have now. Of course, you know, the computing power was, was uh, not, not, I mean, probably the same as we have on the cell phones now. Uh, but anyway, to, to do this numerics then, it was highly non-trivial. In any case, uh, what, he did, what he concluded is that uh, this system uh, can oscillate, and he predicted the, oscillate, the oscillations. And then interestingly, so this was the paper in 1965, and it was almost completely forgotten for a number of, of decades. Um, the people came back to this paper when uh, they started to work exactly on molecular mechanisms of circadian oscillators. And now, uh, just, to, just to illustrate how, how actually relevant uh, this paper is, uh, here is another model. So it is Goldbutter model of, uh, uh, the person is Albert Goldbutter. Uh, it's called Goldbutter model of circadian oscillator. So just to remind you on circadian oscillator, so uh, I told you about uh, this spider, which is very good night hunter, and about how drastic the change is uh, between the day and night of the photoreceptor cells. Uh, and by the way, uh, the biology behind circadian oscillator is, is not trivial either. So for quite some time, what people were thinking is that changes like that, uh, they happened uh, through, ex through uh, basically external signal. In other words, light. So basically that this spider is somehow is, is seeing when, when it's light outside. And then when it is light, it has this structure of photoreceptor membrane. Uh, it senses when it is dark outside, and then it has more elaborate structure of the membrane. But then actually you can do a very simple experiment. You can take your spider and put it in a black box. And when you put it in the black box, this thing, these oscillations will continue for quite some time. Uh, so from this you see that uh, it has nothing to do with some external clues. So these oscillations are uh, actually completely inherent to the biochemistry of the system. But then in any way, uh, so this is a gold butter model of the circadian oscillator. It came decades from uh, this initial Goodwin model. Uh, and what gold butter says is that uh, here you have gene which is called period. And I told you also a little bit about that. So uh, in the beginning of genetics, uh, the genes had a very suggestive name. Uh, this one was called period because if you mutate this gene, uh, people observed that in fruit flies, uh, you, perturb, you, uh, you disturb your circadian oscillator. Okay? So we have your period gene, so uh, it gets uh, transcribed, and then this transcript must uh, get out of the nucleus. And then uh, it is... Uh, degraded, okay? Uh, and then uh, after that it is translated, but then translation also happens with a delay. So here uh, you have uh, one phosphorylation reaction, here you have the other phosphorylation reaction, and then you must have uh, your protein back inside the cell, and then it will repress the system, okay? Uh, so uh, what I should tell you, if you uh, do the simulation of the Goldblatter model, you get oscillations, but you need actually extremely high value of cooperativity. So uh, what Goldblatter found is that uh, you need a cooperativity to be as high as eight in order to uh, be able to see oscillations. Uh, and actually, the another uh, essential thing in this oscillator is this third component. So in principle, the most simple thing would be that you have just your RNA, just your protein, but then for the oscillations to happen, you must have, uh, in this 
uh, Goodwin setup, you must have the thing. And uh, uh, why I think this, this thing is necessary, actually, what it makes. Well, to have your oscillator, what we said is one thing is negative feedback. Then the other thing is nonlinearity, right? This is why you need, uh, you must have uh, this high n. And the third thing, the repression hap should happen with what? Well, we must have delay in the system. And this third thing is in Goodwin model is, is providing the delay. Okay. And now, uh, Okay, so uh, in the gold butter model, you see that you have quite some delay because this messenger RNA has to be exported out. Then there is, uh, it has to be translated. There are two phosphorylations. It has to go back to the nucleus. So there, there is much larger delay inherently present in the system than in the Goodwin model. And the consequence is that oscillations are, can be done uh, by much more realistic value of this Hill constant that is of cooperativity. So n equals to 4 means that four proteins uh, should come together and repress the gene. Uh, so tetramer is fairly common in regulation of transcription. But then, you know, octamer, it is really exotic. So uh, from that sense, the Goodwin model was not very realistic. But just take, take in account of how much before any molecular mechanisms uh, it was developed. And, and it's really the same thing, right? So here you have negative feedback. You have delay, uh, you have your cooperativity, so exactly as, more or less exactly as Goodwin has written uh, a few decades ago. And uh, I should just pay attention, so uh, I will not write all the equations here, but just what happens here. So here we have this term which gives us transcription activity. And again, uh, this n corresponds to n molecules which are being, being bound, so here we have just repression. And actually, I should pay attention to one more thing. So this is the dissociation constant. And this dissociation constant is, this is actually uh, proportional to our exponent, our exponent of the binding energy divided by KBT. So do not be confused. Uh, uh, in the models, you will sometimes see the binding energy written explicitly. And sometimes you will see the dissociation constant. So for example, here, the dissociation constant is written. Okay. And also, to go back to one of your questions from the uh, last lecture, so this is decay term. Again, do not be confused. So uh, we often write decay just to the mass action law, just to be linear. They are actually proportional to the transcript concentration. But here, you assume that this degradation is actually catalyzed. And this is the michaelis menten constant, which, which comes uh, into, uh, into this degradation process. And actually, by having X, you have your system even more nonlinear. So uh, again, just the take-home message, if you want oscillations, what you must have is strong nonlinearity. And in this model, it comes to both of these things, actually more, more to this than to this. But anyway, you have, you have two nonlinear terms. You must have uh, negative feedback. And third, you must have the, the delay. And the larger nonlinearity and the larger delay there is, the more easily you will get the oscillations. Okay, so this was the gold butter model. And now uh, I will actually, so this is the model of the process in the cell itself. And uh, now, now I will come to uh, two synthetic oscillators. And uh, the first one, actually, I also mentioned it on, this, on the, on the uh, second lecture. The first one uh, is one of the two systems which started synthetic biology. So we started this idea that you can artificially make things in the cell, which will demonstrate some function. So repressilator was uh, made back in, uh, uh, in, in the beginning of the center, actually, by uh, Elowitz and Leibler. Uh, and uh, it is, again, delay oscillator. So it is, again, the same idea from this original gold butter model. Uh, it simply says that if you want to have oscillator, uh, you should have a negative feedback loop, and you should have delay. And the larger the delay that you have, uh, the better, and also the larger cooperativity that you have, the better. And this is actually what they, they implemented synthetically. So the way it was implemented is that it, if, you, if you have three genes, so here is gene one, gene two, and gene three, 
and each of these genes represses each other. So gene one represses gene two, gene two represses gene three, and then gene three represses gene one. Okay. Uh, and now, uh, okay, so uh, if you want to, uh, well, not to make mistake when you are analyzing your feedback loop. So there is this rule about, simple rule about the signs. So start from your gene, and if it is repression, assign minus sign to it. Okay, so here we have one repression, one minus sign. Then we have another repression, another minus sign. We have the third repression, the third minus sign. So we have three minus signs, and then you just multiply them. So three minus signs, it will give what if you multiply them? Minus, exactly. So in other words, effectively, uh, what will happen here? Acti Self-activation or self-repression? Well, we said repression, right? Because minus is repression, plus is activation, right? So there is repression here. So there is negative feedback loop here. And moreover, this negative feedback loop through these three genes, uh, it happens with a delay because first you must have a second gene, then you must have a third gene, and then it goes back to the first gene, okay? And they were also uh, quite aware of, of the need to have large cooperativity. These genes are actually, uh, they are tetramers, so they bind to each other as tetramers. So you have all three ingredients, and in this way, uh, they got their oscillator, okay? And now we can also uh, understand the equations, okay? Uh, so uh, these are actually, I think, original equations uh, from, the, from, from this Nature uh, uh, 2000 paper. Okay, uh, so what... Okay, so uh, what this equation tells us is the gene one, it is being repressed by gene three, okay? Uh, again, it happens cooperatively, that is why we have this end term. And we have also degradation of transcript. So this is transcript synthesis. And then we have the same thing about protein, here we have translation, and then here we have degradation of protein. Uh, but now, uh, I also wrote this equation for another reason, uh, and this is again one, one thing which, which in systems biology you very often have, probably also in other, in other, in other uh, parts of uh, well, modeling biological systems. So uh, can you tell me, first of all, uh, you can see this model seems sort of to be reduced, right? So here, uh, this, there is just concentration, and what I told you is that in addition to the concentration, you must have this Boltzmann term, right? You must have exponent to the binding energy. In other words, you must have your dissociation constant here. But here, dissociation constant, there is none, right? Okay. And also here, you see, you must have your time. So th this seems even wrong from the point of units, right? So this, is, this appears to be one over seconds, and here is just, just concentration. Normally, you would have to have degradation rate, which is just, which is one over seconds. So it appears to be dimensionally wrong. So what they have done here in this paper? Okay. Uh, so very often what you, what you do, uh, well, the typical problem, you know, it's not, not so much to write the equations, but actually to find the parameters. And there you have to go to the papers, you know, to, uh, to understand the process, to... Uh, to take the numbers. Now, one way to reduce the number of protein parameters that you, that you work with is to rescale your quantities. In other words, to make your model dimensionless. And this is exactly what is being done here. So uh, this degradation constant, this actually goes to this time t. So this time is not any more absolute time, but this is actually relevant time, relative time, which most of the time is fine. You know, uh, you just need some time scale on which your process happens, okay? And also, the other thing is uh, that the concentrations there are scaled here by the dissociation constant. So again, uh, uh, in biochemical measurements, uh, rarely you have concentration that's expressed in absolute units. Rarely you know how exactly many molecules you have in the cell. You do not have typically them in nanomolecular. Uh, these are typically relative ratios between the concentrations. So then you really do not care in what unit it is expressed. So you can rescale your concentration by the dissociation constant. And by doing this rescaling, you're effectively reducing the number of parameters that you work with. 
And this really happens in practice very often in the models. Okay. And now uh, you can simulate again your model. Uh, okay, now the simulation was not the problem because it was not done back in 1963. And actually they have uh, done, uh, done this both deterministically and stochastically. Uh, more or less uh, you get the same conclusion. So uh, here is the deterministic so, uh, solution. Uh, so what you see after some transition period, you have stable oscillations, which happens. So the, the amplitude is uh, constant. Uh, and here, uh, well, we went through this in much more details, uh, through bifurcations that can happen, bifurcation diagrams, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and so on. Uh, so I will not, uh, we did this in the working group, but uh, I just want to show you, uh, right, for the purpose of general knowledge. So uh, this is bifurcation diagram, which is associated with, uh, with these equations. So uh, it tells you in what range of the parameters your system will oscillate and where it will not oscillate. Okay. Uh, so, by the way, uh, does this system necessarily have to oscillate? I mean, can you see what is the, it's trivial, right? What is the steady state of the system? Where the system can, can, can happily stay forever? Well, it is just repression here, right? There is nothing to activate things. So if everything is on zero, the system is happy, right? It will stay indefinitely there, okay? Uh, so only when you lose stability of this stationary state, when uh, this state becomes unstable, only then you will get oscillations, or uh, we discussed this, what is, what is in uh, nonlinear dynamics called the limit cycle, okay? Uh, and then, so, Sorry for this. So uh, this diagram actually happens, ha tells you where you do not have oscillations and where you do have oscillations. So this is boundary between not having oscillations and having oscillations. So what, in on the, what is on the y-axis here is ratio of uh, the decay rates of, uh, of protein to uh, messenger RNA. So this is on the y-axis. Here is the promoter strength on the x-axis. And here uh, this bifurcation diagrams, because you cannot go to 3D, right, but you want to analyze the third parameter as well. So here, uh, I mean, you can in principle go to 3D, but it's, it's not very clear. So uh, what, is, what is shown here is, uh, is different values of cooperativity. So here is a large, cooper relatively large cooperativity, here is smaller cooperativity, here is the smallest cooperativity. So what you can tell me from this bifurcation diagram uh, if you have larger cooperativity, what happens? Does it help the oscillations or the other way around? So he, here you see, for small value of cooperativity, you have only this region where you have oscillations, but then for larger value of cooperativity, all of these are oscillations. So then large cooperativity does what? helps the oscillations, right, definitely. Okay, then another thing which you can see that helps oscillations, so if you t look at this beta ratio of protein to information RNA decay rate, so this is on a log scale, so 10 to zero is one, right? So you can see that this curve sort of has a maximum on one, right? So again, when the protein to, inform to message on RNA decay rate is about the same, it, uh, uh, this is uh, this oscillations like that. Do you have any idea why this is so? So we said cooperativity helps the oscillations. Then we said the other thing that helps the oscillation is the delay. So is this how, somehow related with the delay that you have approximately equal right uh, information RNA and 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 protein decay rates? So uh, what would happen if, if one of these two species would degrade uh, much more rapidly? You, you remember the rapid equilibrium approximation. What, what that happens? When essentially dynamics of that species then gets out, right? Uh, so you can, you can change it with just uh, algebraic equation. Okay, so uh, then what would happen uh, if one of the, time, the two time scales would be much faster, what would happen is that you would redu reduce the delay. 
because you would not go to two steps. You would not go to, effectively not go to the two, two steps. You would not go to end messenger RNA and then protein. So this is why it, it helps to the oscillations to have uh, about the similar uh, protein and uh, messenger RNA decay rate. Okay, uh, and also, uh, okay, so uh, then they did simulation of the system and then afterwards uh, they basically implemented uh, their model and, and what they learned from here, like this ratio of the decay rates, large cooperativity, this was actually implemented in the model and this is still principle of the synthetic biology. So uh, ordinary, if you, if you would do experiment in biology, you know, you would do experiment first and then perhaps try to explain some things uh, to a model. But then in synthetic biology, it is really like in engineering. So a common approach is that you first model your system, you determine how optimally it will work by using the model, and then you constructed it. And it was actually implemented in, uh, by, uh, by Elowitz and Leibler. Uh, okay, uh, and now, uh, okay, so the last thing, uh, and I think I have, yeah, just about five minutes more, I think. Uh, so, uh, the last thing was uh, this cell cycle oscillator that I mentioned. So, uh, there is activator and repressor. So, activating is ac activator is activating the repressor. The repressor is repressing the activator. Activator has a positive feedback loop. And then I will not go again through this. So, I already explained why you have oscillations. So, for example, if it is cyclin and which is activator and cyclic de dependent kinase which is repressor, what happens, you first have this activation, uh, positive feedback loop, so the activator, in this case cyclin, will go up, right? But then it will activate the repressor, the repressor will accum accumulate. When the repressor accumulates, then it represses the activator, so activator goes down, right? Uh, but then if the activator goes down, then the repressor will go down as well, and you have everything repeated. Okay, so this is inside the cell. But then uh, this relaxation oscillator, can, can it be implemented synthetically as well? And this was done uh, by Husty and, and, and collaborators. And again, it was done in two steps. Uh, although here it was really uh, two separate papers and quite some time uh, between them. So first the system was uh, theoretically proposed, and just to go to references, so uh, this is the reference, this uh, PRL paper, and it is in 2002, and actually with quite some delay, it was, uh, it was then experimentally implemented. And by the way, when they experimentally implemented the system, they, they found out that uh, the model should be modified as well, but I will not go uh, into that, you can, I don't have time, you can read the paper itself, okay? Uh, but anyway, so uh, we are discussing this original model uh, from PRL. Uh, so uh, what happens is that, uh, well, uh, like in this scheme, you have your activator, okay? Uh, and then uh, it's activating the repressor. The repressor is then repressing your activator. And also here, uh, what you can see is that uh, actually, this uh, delay oscillator, uh, I'm sorry, relaxation oscillator, so that they, they look differently from the delay oscillators. It is essentially, again, very much the same principle. So again, what you have is negative feedback, okay, because here you have activation, here is our plus, okay, and here is our repression, here is our minus. So if we start from the gene and go back to itself, plus multiplied by minus, it's effectively the minus, so we have a negative feedback loop. And moreover, it happens with delay, right, because it goes through, through one gene. Okay. And then, uh, okay, so uh, in addition to this negative feedback, what we have also is, is positive feedback, so this is uh, this thing here. But then actually this negative feedback, it necessarily in this relaxation oscillators, it must happen slower than the positive feedback. So this is actually a requirement for these oscillations to work. Uh, okay, and now uh, here are the configurations, how this is actually implemented. So briefly it is implemented to, uh, so these are activators which are being bound. 
So either one activator dimer can be bound, either two activators dimer can be bound, and the repressor is bound in the form of tetramer. And then again, so uh, by using what, what we have learned today, uh, you can understand the equations uh, which were written in this paper. So again, these, these are activating configurations. So activating configurations, they, co they correspond to either the empty promoter, so this is the empty promoter, they correspond to one dimer being bound, so imagine only this being bound. By the way, this is PRL, so this picture is not very pedagogical, how to say, everything is clumped together, so you do not see different configurations, but you can imagine this. So uh, one activator uh, can be bound, right? So this is uh, the X squared term. Then two of the activators can be bound. This is, again, the activating configuration, so this is the X fourth term. And then you see you have all these possibilities, but with tetramer being bound, when tetramer is being bound, you do not have RNA polymerase being bound. So this is why they do not come in the numerator, they just come in the denominator. So these are all these configurations, again, by multiplied by y to the factor of four. And, well, this is uh, what happens here, okay? Uh, all right, and then, again, you can simulate your system. You will have, uh, you will have uh, oscillations of your activator and, and the repressor. Here is this limit cycle. Uh, well, uh, we talked about phase plane limit cycles and so on in the working group, so I will not go into much details here, but uh, okay. Uh, so uh, this is the literature. So uh, what I would highly recommend, so regarding uh, oscillators, if you at least have time, so these are sort of really historical papers, so this one is about repressilator, as I already mentioned, this, uh, this is about the relaxation oscillator. Uh, then there are these references about modeling restriction modification systems, so these are actually free nucleic acid research papers. Uh, this is our collaboration with, uh, uh, with experimental colleagues, and as I mentioned, uh, I put these papers because, well, first of all, you know, it's, it's uh, well, uh, bits and pieces from this first paper actually came to the presentation, but I, I put the other papers as well because they're sort of illustration of, uh, of how experiment and, uh, and modeling uh, can go together. And it is also illustration of another thing which I didn't have time to mention and discuss here. But actually, uh, what you can see, these are different, uh, these restriction modification systems actually come to very different architectures and to very different uh, regulation. But actually, it is the same principles which are implemented uh, by these systems. So here you see, uh, as you face uh, essentially the different architectures, how the same uh, properties of the system are, are being employed. And uh, then, uh, I already, I think, mentioned once, so one of the main goals of synthetic of systems biology is actually uh, to find the same design principles behind mechanistically otherwise different uh, biological systems. And I will conclude with that. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Questions? Okay, so we should go to the dinner then, right? Okay. <laughs>